we have our next speaker, um, Rajiv Sharma, has been with OCP a little over a year. And uh, Rajiv is an industry veteran with over 20 years of experience in software and in hardware. Uh, he's been with HP, he's been with Dell, and now he's bringing that wealth of experience to OCP. He is our director of software and technologies, and he is here to tell you all about what's happening in the OCP project communities. Please welcome Rajiv Sharma. Thanks, Archana. Here you go. Hi, folks. Good morning. Good morning. I was about to say, Gauza. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say it correctly? Yes, that's right. uh oh. I, I tried. I tried. <laughs> I tried. You guys, come on. Yes. All right, so as Archana mentioned, I'm the director of software at Open Compute, and my responsibility is to evangelize software within the OCP ecosystem. Earlier, you guys knew that uh, uh, OCP was more known as a hardware company, but now we are, our inclination is more on the software as well, because we are planning to work on integrated solutions where you have the hardware and the software, and with, with different solutions you install on it. All right, let's kick start. Um, Archana did talk about you know, some of the projects that are currently active within our community. And uh, considering the time that I have, I'm going to skin off some of the information, but uh, this slide will be posted or will be uploaded onto a shared drive. Feel free to look into it, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I will have my contact information in this slide deck. And also, feel free to grab me you know, after my presentation is over. I will be delighted to um, answer any questions that you guys might have. All right? All right, so a couple of projects we have it and a couple of sub-projects. But I'm not going to talk about all these sub-project or projects. And my focus would be on the open system firmware. And uh, I will dig deeper into what I mean by open system firmware. Also, what is OpenRMC, which is a sub-project under the hardware management. All right, we'll talk more about it in detail. Third one is the OCP accelerator infrastructure, which comes under the, um, the server project. And this is one of the new projects that, that was launched a few months ago. It's very important, very critical. And, you know, then, and you'll see more about the efforts being going on in this, in this project. And lastly, I will talk about Open Edge because this is what exactly the theme is for, for this session is about edge computing, what exactly we mean by edge, and uh, what is OCP's definition about edge, and the edge products that we have in marketplace, and, uh, and what exactly is going on. I will dig deeper into that. All right, open system firmware. So there is a confusion in the market about you know, what exactly a system firmware is. There is million of firm, millions of firmware in a device, right? From the cloud node perspective within the hardware, it gets very complex about what exactly do we mean by system firmware. So let's dig deeper into it. So on your top left, what you see here is the uh, a rack, right? And you also see that within the rack, you have some networking device, you have PDUs, and you can couple of things that fit into that rack, right? Now, to simplify it further, let's divide the concept into two piece parts. Uh, one is the, uh, the control plane, meaning something that controls the rack, like your rack manager, right? The other is the data plane, and data plane is what? Where the magic happens, where the actual processing happens, where the compute happens. So when we talk about data plane, you know, the best example is the server on the, uh, on the top right. Server, right? Um, so talking about server, there are so many different firmwares that the server entails. So many, sorry, so many firmware. And a couple of firmwares that's fresh in my mind, I will talk about it, is the UEFI firmware is one. You have BMC firmware. I'm sure you guys know about BMC firmware. And uh, you have, uh, <laughs> even power supply has a firmware. Every, every, every device that you have it in a server has a firmware. And 
SSDs and M.2s and whatnot. Now let's talk about UEFI firmware. But traditionally, the definition of a system firmware is nothing but a, a BIOS. And I'm pretty sure that you guys know what BIOS is. Right, um, there are so many implementations of BIOS now these days. And uh, UEFI is one of, the, one of its implementations, right? And if you look right there, even in the UEFI, UEFI firmware, there are so many different modules. So it gets complex. So it gets very complex. Moving on is, I'm sure most of you guys have attended the OCP Summit, and you see so much of hardware. Right? Even here in the booths, you see so much of hardware, and hardware keeps changing. You attend any other conference, you see a different hardware. So the nucleus of the hardware is what? Firmware. Uh, right? And uh, firmware is pretty much closed right now. BIOS is pretty much closed because you have to talk to different IVVs, you have to talk to different BIOS vendors and get their code, compile it, maintain it, and it gets so frustrating. You can't do any prototyping work, right? You cannot do any conceptual design or conceptual testing because it's a proprietary code. It's so much closed, it's very difficult. So we need to literally catch up from that perspective, right? Moving on, um, as I said earlier, there are so many BIOS implementations. If you look at Microsoft, they are more focused on Windows, right? So which means that they followed the UEFI path. For other companies like uh, Facebook, or Google, they're heavily vested on Linux. So they have their own implementation. So our goal is to converge all these implementations and provide an end user to pick the right path that suits their business needs. All right, so let me tell you very clearly this, this is not an architectural diagram because we are not there yet. This is just a concept, and by the way, this concept keeps changing. But the idea is pretty clear about you know, what this open system firmware project is doing. Uh, I will go through it pretty quickly. Uh, right at the bottom, what you see is there are so many silicon vendors that provide their own interfaces. Right? And uh, what we need right now is a module, which we call it as a silicon interface firmware module, that's going to select a particular path which what a user selects, right? Let me give you an example here. So let's say, um, you know, one can go from core boot with the help of Intel or AMD and go boot uh, Linux. Similarly, one can go through uh, Linux boot and uh, boot Windows, or vice versa. There are so many options. And again, this is what our main goal is, to converge different implementations and come up with a one form factor and let the user decide what makes more sense for them. All right? Moving on. So let me talk about the Open RMC project. So I talked about the firmware. I talked about a server. I talked about BIOS. We were pretty much managing uh, one entity. But you know, open compute was heavily investing on uh, racks and, and power and whatnot. So we had to think about, hey, you know what, how do we do, how do we manage a rack as one complete entity? How we do a, an out of band management uh, monitoring system for the whole rack? So that was the triggering factor where we came up with uh, open RMC, right? And the concept is, you know, once we have that RMC firmware, it should do a couple of things. It should, it should be a firmware, it should be able to install some software, it should be able to run some applications, and whatnot, right? Um, I will spend pretty less, less time, but the idea here is that you have the um, RMC firmware, 
right? And on your left side, we use different conventions we call as the northbound side of RMC. And on the right side, there are some protocols, what we call it as the southbound side of the RMC. And uh, to explain a little bit more, all the storage and the compute node and the GPUs are sitting on the right-hand side, which is the device-bound side. And on the left side, what we have is the data center information system sitting in there. And what this data center information system does is it, with the help of the orchestration software, talk to the RMC manager, which is right in the middle. And there are so many different options or protocols that you can implement to talk to the rack manager. And some of the things, some of the uh, protocols that I mentioned here is the Redfish, Swordfish, SSH, the RESTful API is pretty common now these days. And of course, the GUI, which you can use to manage your uh, rack infrastructure. Same thing on the right side, we pretty much use the same protocol, but with the only difference is that we also use the low level protocols like IPMI, and I'm sure most of you guys are aware of what IP IPMI is, and also the I2C protocol, right? So at some point of time, we will have the RMC firmware available. Now how to use that RMC firmware? We can pretty much use it in our existing infrastructure that we have it within open compute. On your left side, you have the open rack, and it's already there as of today. And um, what we plan to do is we can, we, sh we should be able to install the RMC firmware in a power shelf itself. And uh, for example, Schneider as of today, have a power shelf that does support some firmware, but you can literally modify it and have the RMC capability installed in that shelf and uh, have that rack as an RMC ready rack. You know, the key thing here is that you're not changing any hardware, so there is no upfront hardware cost associated with it. So that's the beauty of RMC is there, there are no upfront costs where you are just deploying it on the existing infrastructure. So on the middle one is uh, the EIA open rack, the same concept where you have the um, switch and, um, and you can have the, for the RMC firmware installed onto that switch and it gives you RMC functionality. And by the way, you can also connect uh, the, the power shelf with that switch as well. Okay, the, the last one is the, um, the another option for RMC is the, of course the Microsoft. Um, uh, Olympus, where they have the microchip which does the, um, the RMC work. All right, so let me mo keep moving. So I talked about, and by the way, so I talked about, um, I talked about the OSF, I talked about RMC. If you guys are interested to uh, dig deeper into what these projects are, please visit our website, go to the project page, look for these projects, and subscribe to the mailing list. And one more thing is, I talked about all those projects. I mean, those projects don't, do not work in silos. I mean, there's a close collaboration in between those projects. So there's a lot of synergy and collaboration going on you know, within those projects or sub-projects. So let me talk about open accelerator infrastructure. Um, right now, what we see is you know, these hardware accelera accelerators are exponentially increasing. Right, um, I, I did look at it recently and I was able to find around 48 companies that have different kind of chips that support these hardware accelerators. Right, and from the OCP perspective, what we are trying to do is to work on a common factor, create a system that our community can use it. Right, so let, let me keep moving, so I talked about the form factor. Right now what you see on the screen is, on your left is the Facebook AI platforms form factors. Here in the middle what you see is the Microsoft provided form factors, the, their AI platform, and on the extreme right is the Baidu AI platforms. So you have three options. And the goal for open compute is to commonize all this form factor and come up with one system that everybody can use it, 
That's the goal. That's what we are trying to achieve in the open um, uh, AM uh, um, subproject. Okay, so keep moving. So let's talk about the logical components of the AI hardware system. All right, so what I mean by that is you have all these accelerators in green boxes, right? You need something that holds those accelerators, and what that holding thing is nothing but the, the board. You need a CPU that controls it, so that's why you have CPU. You need something that connects CPU to the accelerators, and what that thing is, nothing but the PCI switch. All this thing can be bundled into one chassis. Right? Right? No, you can disaggregate this and make it more flexible, meaning now you have this. You, you just disaggregated it. Now, what next? Now, in order to support this system, you need a new infrastructure, meaning you need a power, you need cooling. There are different ways you can accommodate or achieve power. You can have a shared power or you can have a distributed power. When I talk about shared power, I'm sure you guys are aware of the, uh, the bus bar concept. So you can utilize that concept here. Same with the cooling. You can have a centralized cooling. You can have distributed cooling. Okay. Now what makes this uh, hardware solution different than a server? The key thing is this hardware solution requires high bandwidth. Right, because that's what the accelerator does it, right? You, you need high, uh, high bandwidth to make it work. And, uh, and also, you, you scale out. So in order to do that, you need a high speed expansion length that you see on the top. Okay? So keep moving. Um, so there are different form factors. I talked about it. We have two form factors. One is the PCI chem form factor. But since I mentioned earlier that our requirement is more of high bandwidth, we actually prefer the mezzanine form factor. All right, so now here, as of today, we do have Microsoft HGX1 form factor available. We do have the Facebook Big Basin form factor, mezzanine form factor available as of today, and also the Baidu's X-Men form factor mezzanine available as of today. So I talked about you know, the, the logical uh, structure of the, uh, the hardware accelerators. And there are so many different topologies that you can use it. There are so many uh, interconnect topologies based on your needs. There are so many IOs that you can accommodate within this OAI infrastructure. When I say IO, meaning the compute IO, the networking IO, the um, the uh, I.O. between the CPU and the accelerators and whatnot. Same thing with the um, cooling. You can have the liquid cooling, air cooling. And you know, when you have all these different options, of course, you need a management that manages this whole infrastructure. So that's what our plan is, to have different options provided you know, for this, um, this um, you know, OAM solution. So and of talking about OAI, so the thing is, so what, from the OCP perspective, we are doing it. We are trying to work on a, bo a board. We are trying to work on, it on different trays so that you can move those trays onto chassis. We want to work on building new chassis that support those trays, right? And those trays should be able to support um, different motherboards, base boards. Those base boards should be able to support different uh, modules and those modules should be able to support different solutions provided by different partners. And of course, the manageability part and the security that comes along with it. So, um, so we followed a very uh, modular, uh, we, we implemented this in a very modular way. We have the logical blocks, we have the physical blocks. All the information that you see here it, it construct the logical blocks. Your OAM is a physical uh, entity itself and the tray is nothing but the uh, modular element for serviceability, and then the system management piece. And I know I'm going pretty quickly, but as I said earlier, these slides will be shared, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, you know, to reach out to me. All right, so talk about the open edge. Um, right now, you know, there's a study, and uh, it's, it's, it's assumed, or it's projected, that by 2020, you will have so much of data. So much of data. Right, and um, the question here is, 
What are you going to do with that data? You have two options. Either to store all that data in a centralized location, right? Process it and get some actionable insights. Or you have an option of, you know what? I want to take some of the data and put it in an edge location. Why? Because you see it's pretty quick, pretty robust. You save some bandwidth. And here exactly is the key where a customer or a partner has to decide about their use case or their workload. What makes more sense? Where they want to put their, their data in the centralized cloud or in the edge location? And uh, eventually, there will be so much of local data that needs to be processed in an edge location. You will have videos, 8Ks, so much of things, so much of IoT connected devices. So there's a lot of opportunity there. All right, so keep moving. Um, so what, what is edge? You know, in my definition, I look edge as a spectrum of different locations. Spectrum of different locations. As you see here, it's moving from petro, metro pop to pre-aggregated sites, to the base stations, to centralized offices. These are all different locations. Now, the key thing in the edge computing is the, uh, is the low latency. How do you achieve low latency? You virtualize your infrastructure, right? You use VMs or containers and whatnot, so you're pretty much you know, uh, getting more efficient on the edge side of the things, right? So this thing I wanted to mention here was that you know, your workload, again, is very important where you, uh, based on what your workload is, you deploy that workload on that edge location. And let me give you a quick example. Smart city is one workload where um, we're uh, in a smart city. So where exactly would you try to install your workload? Hey, you know what? Let's do that in a Metropop site. Another use case is the, um, the um, ambulance where a patient is being operated in an ambulance and the ambulance is moving and the doctor is in a call with another doctor getting information of how to operate that patient. So you need low latency. Right, so how should you operate that workload? Mean that your workload has to be closer to the subscriber. I'm just giving you different examples. Um, so, from Gartner, by 2020, this is very important. By 2022, 30% of the service providers that have deployed 5G will also deploy edge computing services. 30% is quite a number in the next couple of years. And the second bullet point is 50% of enterprise data will be created and processed outside the traditional data center uh, or cloud. Enterprise locations, meaning that you know, your edge is bleeding into enterprise locations. Your campus and your branch, they're all getting virtualized, right? This is pretty substantial change in the enterprise sector. So the key thing I wanted to mention here is virtualize, and I'm going to read, um, virtualizing the edge infrastructure and operating it on the edge cloud is going to be the fundamental of how 5G gets rolled out. Virtualization is going to play a critical role because low latency, high bandwidth is, is what, what dictates your edge. Um, okay. So going over quickly, um, so I'm going to this talk very much in short, you have x-axis, which defines the bandwidth, and your y-axis, which talks about the latency. These are different use cases that the companies uh, you know, work on. For, for the sake of explanation, let me talk about remote battery sensors use case. Every IoT device in this world has a sensor, right? That sensor uh, requires a low bandwidth, and that sensor also requires a low latency because they are connected to the IoT gateway, thereby preser preserving the bandwidth. So it, f it fits pretty much in there. Now let's talk about CDN, which is like, again, content delivery network. You have 8K, so much of big videos. For that, you require high bandwidth, and you require near about 50 milliseconds of latency, right? So similarly, as of today, if you have to move your sensor data to the cloud takes about 200 milliseconds. You know what 5G says? 5G says within five milliseconds. So we are not there yet, but we'll be there. Um, so um, there, as I said, the cloud infrastructure is distributed. 
and uh, and every architect they plan about technology implement, implementing through different facade and things like that. But the key is here is day three. It's a new concept called as day three. Day three meaning operations first, meaning that even if you have so much of technologies and things in place, you know you have to keep in mind about people and processes because they are the ones who are, who are actually going to implement uh, the day-to-day -day operations side of the edge business. All right, so from the open compute perspective, we do have the open uh, edge chassis overview. Uh, it's is in, uh, it comes in different form factor. It is in the in our marketplace. So I'm not going to go over all the specifications. If you need more information, please feel free to go to our website and get more details on it. Now, quick announcements. And again, I'm not going to steal the thunder. I'm just going to touch upon the announcements. And you will hear more about these announcements from our speakers, uh, upcoming speakers um, you know, in this session. So the um, Vivin is going to announce their EP100 platform. Uh, based on the Nokia contributor design. And these are the pictures of that hardware. And if you're interested, you go to the booth and you will see more information about the EP100. And also the design server slot for Open Compute MES3 for Nix. And uh, the EP100 will have the support for the RMC that I talked about earlier. And also, there is going to be a dev kit for the Open Edge, meaning that the dev kit will support the OSF, it will support the, uh, the, uh, the, the BMC, and things like that. So that pretty much concludes my presentation. So if you have any questions, as I said, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much.